Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, being with us and thank you again for your patience. Uh, today we will start the uh, information session organized by the College of Health and Life Sciences, member of Hamad bin Khalifa University. Uh, Dr. George, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Hayakum Allah. Uh, today we are going to uh, go over uh, the essentials uh, that you would like to see at the College of Health and Life Sciences. This information science uh, information session is going to be lasting for one hour. And uh, with no further delay, I will start with the agenda of the information session. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll start with the Dean's welcome note. Then we are going to uh, go over uh, the divisions, uh, the division of biological and biomedical sciences, the division of genomics and translational biomedicine, the division of exercise science, health and epidemiology, and uh, what is important for you student who would like to, uh, to join us, of course, are the admissions requirement. And at the end, we are going to have uh, a series of question and answer session, and of course, a closing remarks uh, with uh, all members uh, of the opening session. Um, next slide, please. So what I would like to emphasize on during this session is that uh, this is an interacting platform and uh, what uh, you would like to ask as question, of course, will be part of the Q&A session at the end, but you can post your, uh, your question in the uh, question and the uh, Q&A tab on the lower side. So uh, the most important thing is that you need to turn off your speaker so that everybody can uh, hear well and uh, with no further delay, I would like to welcome you again and uh, start the session so that you can grab the most important notes from this uh, important session for your career. So I would like to start by a few words concerning our College of Health and Life Sciences. For those of you, of course, you don't know me because I'm not listed yet on the website as the interim dean. I started my mandate probably in January 1st, 2022. And I would like to uh, highlight the importance of uh, the College of Health and Life Sciences, not only in Qatar, but also in the region as a hub for uh, you to join because it is the way we would like to have uh, the future being built with a, a human capacity that's going to make an impact on human lives. The College of Health and Life Sciences at HBKU is relatively a new college. Uh, it is maybe four years old, so it is not uh, a, a, an old student, as we say. It's still uh, in a growth period. And uh, what's important is that it has in, in, in its divisions the three pillars for integrating what would be like uh, the best um, uh, venue to do research and more importantly, to spread knowledge. And these three entities are uh, the biological and biomedical sciences, the genomics and translational biomedicine, and exercise science, health, and epidemiology. epidemiology. The three entities are linked together in order to provide the best in health and life sciences. And um, what I would like to emphasize here, and you are going to see through the program coordinators who are going really to go through the programs in depth, is that our college, in fact, is the first and unique in the region, which is offering these three entities as uh, different from other curricula that are present in universities in the region and uh, will, uh, um, will, will have really an impact in your career because it's going to be a unique path. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that our college and our university is a multicultural environment where we are helping to foster ties between different uh, regions of the world. We want to create a, not to create, but to come up with uh, researchers who are going to be uh, uh, worldwide recognized as uh, intellectuals who are going to have impact on health and life of human beings. Uh, I would like to emphasize that our college is made up of uh, uh, faculties from across the board and they have the, from across the ranks and in a hierarchy that is going to foster the development of new researchers all the way. So we have uh, 17 professors 
uh, four at the rank of full professor, but the majority of the rank of the rank of assistant professor. We have currently more than 130 students across the three divisions. We have so far around 80 alumni, and I'm going to emphasize that our research is being uh, well uh, recognized throughout a pub publications record, which features a high in edge index and in, in, in publications in high impact uh, factor journals. Uh, Finally, I don't want to um, uh, to take the time uh, to go into the details about each division and what are the expectations. I would like I would like to invite the program coordinators to explain to you in in depth what are the programs that we are offering and why we are unique and why we welcome you on board from any part of this world. So, uh, with no further delay, I would like to um, uh, invite uh, Dr. Fadl Tisir. Uh, who is the program coordinator of the biological and biomedical sciences to go over the program. Fadal, the, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. George. So, yeah, my name is Fadal Tisir. Um, I am the, the program coordinator and the chair of the admission committee of biological and biomedical sciences. I will refer to them as BVS, to be simple. And it is a real pleasure for me to tell you a few words about the BBS programs. Basically, we have two programs. Can you please, with the, the next, uh, we have two programs. The first one is a master that is typically achieved in two years. It consists of uh, 33 credit programs uh, uh, that uh, contain, include five, Four courses, three elective courses, attendance of the college seminars, research work in two semesters, and uh, the crafting, writing, and the defense of a master thesis. The PhD program is a uh, 54 credit program that includes uh, three mandatory courses three elective courses, participation again to the, the, the college seminars and research work of a minimum of six semesters. Next slide, please, Marika. So the, the BBS uh, pro research programs have two main goals. The first one is to understand how uh, defective and dysfunctions in genes and uh, proteins disrupt specific biological processes, thereby affecting the function, the normal function of cells and on organs and leading to diseases. The second goal is to exploit the gained knowledge to shape innovative therapeutic strategies and to nurture drug discoveries in many, for many diseases. These include cancer, cardiovascular diseases, hearing loss, obesity, diabetes, neurological disorders, and SARS-CoV-2 infections. Next slide, please. The specificity of the, the, the BBS programs is that they all involve experimental wet lab research. We are using different model systems, and these include uh, cultures of uh, cells. It can be uh, primary cultures of cells or cell lines. We are using uh, organoids. We are using yeast, worms, flies, mice, and human samples. Uh, you all have been to some extent, you have all have been to some extent exposed to uh, research during your undergraduate students, but this will be a little bit different. You will be, will take you one step further. Will not only be observing others doing experiments, you will learn how to design and carry those experiments yourself. 
you will need to come up with the original ideas and create novel knowledge. Your data, and especially for PhD students, must be assessed and approved by peers and get published. And you actually, you need two publications to uh, graduate with a PhD degree. Of course, can I have please the next slide? Next slide, please. You will not be left to yourself in the, in the lab. You will be accompanied, you will be guided by a series of primary faculty members with different backgrounds coming from the best universities from Europe, North America and Asia. And we have many uh, faculty members in, in PBS. We have uh, Dr. Dindia uh, Ramota, who is the division head. He has a PhD in biochemistry from McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and he is interested in drug transport, metabolism, drug discovery, and cancer. We have also uh, uh, Dr. Johan Eriksson, who did his PhD in uh, biochemistry at Stockholm University in Sweden. He works on cholesterol and lipid metabolism, adipocyte differentiation, and gene expression that are dependent on insulin. Dr. Henin Horn, who is the program coordinator, he has a, a PhD from Cincinnati University. His background is in cell biology, and his current research focuses on the role of nuclear envelope proteins in mechanobiology, hearing loss, infertility, and cancer. Dr. Ayman, al Haj Zen. He got a, uh, his MD degree from Aleppo University in Syria and a PhD from Paris 7 University in France. His research focuses on drug discovery for cardiovascular diseases. Dr. Omar Khan, who did a PhD at Gothenburg University in Sweden, he is interested in proteomics, in colorectal cancer, and chemotherapy. Dr. Kabir Biswas did a PhD in Biological Sciences at the Indian Institute Science, Bangalore, India. He is interested in cell biology. His background in cell, is in cell biology. And his research uh, focuses on spatio-mechanical regulation of protein functions, biointerfaces, and biosensors. Dr. Mohammed Farhan, who, did, who has a PhD from Biotechnology Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in Mumbai. He is interested in behavioral neuroscience, the gut brain access, and autism. And myself, I hold a PhD from the Free University of Brussels, Belgium, and my research focuses on neural development, neurodevelopmental disorders and brain tumors. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fadel. Uh, now we are going to move to the next uh, speaker in, in this uh, forum, which who is Dr. Jitash Putin Vitil, who is going to uh, give us an overview about the uh, division of genomic and translational biomedicine, but he will focus on the uh, program, specific programs, genomics and precision medicine in that division. Dr. Jitash, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. Hello, everyone. Um, um, I'm Dr. Jitesh Putanvetil. I'm uh, acting program coordinator and an associate professor with the Division of Genomics and Translational Biomedicine. I'm also the chair for the admission committee for the genomics and precision medicine program. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Fadel mentioned about the BBS program, uh, we also have a master's and PhD program. Uh, the master's and PhD programs are uh, in uh, The master of science program is a 33 credit program. Um, which will be around two years, and uh, there are five uh, mandatory foundation courses um, and uh, an additional three, uh, minimum three elective courses that the student has to take. Um, in addition to this, the students are supposed to attend the departmental seminars and uh, 
uh, since this is uh, a research um, oriented course we have um, uh, the student students will be doing a research work and uh, at the end they will be um, defending writing up their thesis and defending the thesis as well so this is similar to the the bbs program now with the phd again uh, we have a program with a minimum of 54 credits um, typically it takes around uh, four years so in this we have one mandatory foundation course and a minimum of five elective courses so the students who have uh, done the master's course from uh, the, the genomics and precision medicine from the college, uh, they will be able to select uh, uh, five electives, but those who haven't done the course uh, usually will have to take the, the five mandatory courses that we teach uh, um, for the Master of Science program. Uh, in addition to these uh, courses, um, we have the, uh, um, the students will participate in, in departmental seminars, uh, they will also participate in, in the Genomics and Precision Medicine General Club um, and uh, as PhD, as, uh, as you know, the, this is highly research driven. So the students will be undertaking their research under a supervisor and a committee will be um, helping with the research. And then the, at the end of the research, the student will have to write up a dissertation and then defend their dissertation uh, in front of a committee and including external examiner. So that's about the, the master's and PhD program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, of course, um, we have an excellent um, uh, uh, set of faculty members in the genomics and translational biomedicine who will be teaching the genomics and precision, precision medicine, in addition to the faculty members that uh, Dr. Fadel mentioned. Um, Dr. George Nemer, you have already heard him speaking. He is our interim dean and a professor. He uh, did his PhD in pharmacology from the University of Montreal in Canada. Uh, his research interests are mainly in cardiovascular disease. Uh, then we have Dr. Omar Albaga. He is the acting division head and uh, a professor. His PhD is from, uh, from University of Aberdeen in genetics. Um, and he's interested uh, in doing research in type 2 diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, autism spectrum disorder. And then Dr. Borbala Mifsud is an assistant professor who has interest in, um, in research, researching the chromatin interactions and development, uh, genomics and, and leukemia, um, as well as chromatin structure and, and genome-wide association studies. Uh, she did her PhD from University of Vienna in molecular pathology. Then we have Dr. Hassan Purkarimi as an assistant professor. Um, his PhD was from the University of Dundee in the UK uh, in genetics. And his research interests include uh, inheritance of epigenetic information, um, epigenome editing, apoptosis, histone modification, DNA damage. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Nadiel Hedge, um, who did his PhD uh, in human genetics from University of Würzburg in Germany. Uh, as an assistant professor in the division. Uh, his research interests include uh, DNA methylation and aging, effect of aging on gene expression, single nucleus, um, RNA-seq, and DNA methylation. And um, um, in my, um, I did my PhD from uh, Queen's University, Belfast in Northern Ireland, UK. Um, and my research interests include bioinformatics, pharmacogenomics, and uh, rare disease genetics. Next slide, please. Um, our research covers uh, the whole spectrum of uh, precision medicine or precision health, um, like the prediction of disease risk, um, then the precise diagnosis of diseases, the prediction of prognosis and response to drugs. So, for example, um, we study rare diseases to understand uh, their genetics, genetic causes. Um, the, then we predict uh, the risk studies predict the risk to develop complex diseases through the identification of markers and polygenic risk scores. Uh, we also use, say, for example, pharmacogenomics for predicting the efficacy and uh, um, side effects of medications. Um, so in order to do this, we use a variety of samples and techniques, for example, human samples and, and phenotypic data, uh, working with our partners um, like the Hamad Medical Corporation, the Primary Healthcare Center, Sidra Medicine, Qatar Genome, and uh, um, abroad like Genomics England. Um, 
and then we have we also work with in vitro cell culture studies and animal models such as um, uh, C. elegans. Um, then we use a number of technologies such as genomics, transcriptomics, uh, metabolomics, epigenomics, like uh, looking at the DNA methylation, chromatin modeling. Um, and in addition, computational methods are widely used, such as um, uh, bioinformatics pipelines, machine learning, and artificial intelligence algorithms, molecular modeling, and docking um, studies. So these are just to give a flavor of what kind of research that we do. Um, uh, I can answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, hi, my name is Sumaya. I'm a student in the Exercise Science Master's program. I will be taking over to be the moderator for this session. Um, unfortunately, I had some technical issues before, so I couldn't join you earlier. However, uh, let me now introduce uh, Dr. Nathan Townsend, who also happens to be my mentor and thesis supervisor. He's an assistant professor and director for the Exercise Science Program. Please, Dr. Nathan, go ahead and uh, you can start. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the session. Um, thank you for the introduction, Samaya. Uh, I'm actually the program coordinator of the Exercise Science Health and Epidemiology program. Um, can you just move to the next slide, please? Um, our, our college, uh, sorry, our division is, is emerging, and as opposed to the other two divisions, we just have one program at the moment, which is a Master of Science in Exercise Science. As with the other two divisions, this is a 33 credit point program, and there's a range of core mandatory courses, which you can see there. So we have four mandatory courses, um, five elective courses, and then a master's thesis by research program. Um, an important note about this program is that it's a joint program in conjunction with the University of South Carolina. So if you're interested in this program, what uh, happens is you actually will enroll both at HBKU and at the University of South Carolina, and you'll have a degree and a transcript from both universities, um, which is the nature of the joint program. Uh, so we're, we're very lucky to have University of South Carolina as our partner because they are highly ranked in the United States um, in exercise science. Uh, next slide, please. The faculty that we have in the Exercise Science Health and Epidemiology Division is small at the moment, but, uh, but growing. Uh, the, the division head is Associate Professor Paul Grimshaw. Um, he has extensive experience in, in both the UK and Australia, and now here in Qatar in the area of biomechanics. Um, his research interests are very, very wide and include uh, both sport biomechanics, um, sport engineering, um, and also clinical biomechanics applications as well. Uh, we have Dr. Hengman Saw, who's an assistant professor, and her area of expertise is the, the epidemiology of physical activity. So she has interests in looking at um, the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease and its relationship to physical activity, and also cardiovascular disease risk factor analysis. Uh, I am an assistant professor, and my area of interest in, in research is uh, exercise physiology. I've got experience working with both athletes and, uh, in, and looking at some clinical uh, aspects of exercise. And uh, mostly I'm, I'm interested in looking at the effect of high altitude or simulated high altitude or hypoxia on the physio physiological responses to, uh, to exercise. We have an, a couple of, as you can see there, there's a couple of positions which we are currently in the process of filling. So we have an extra, uh, pro uh, an extra faculty member and a lab, man uh, lab manager which will be uh, bringing on hopefully this year. Next slide, please. The, to support our teaching and research, we have some really excellent facilities um, here at HBKU. The Exercise Physiology Laboratory is it's really an excellent, excellent uh, facility. I, I have been to a number of labs all around the world and 
Um, and I really think that this is an excellent laboratory. We have, we have some fantastic equipment, um, top of the line equipment, and this allows us to do some really high quality, excellent research working with human participants. We're also developing a biomechanics laboratory and the space for this laboratory is also really excellent. There is, um, again, um, top of the line equipment designed for doing three-dimensional motion analysis, EMG and um, kinematic analysis uh, and kinetic analysis with a force platform. So really, really excellent facilities there to be working with, you know, sort of doing research in the area of physiology and biomechanics with human participants. Uh, next slide, please. So just to sort of have a look at some of the current research that we have ongoing, and this gives an idea of the, the research breadth and uh, direction um, that we are working in. So we are uh, focused mainly on, on the expertise of our faculty. We are looking at studies uh, involving physiological responses to exercise and uh, looking at, at environmental uh, aspects there. So hypoxia and, and heat therapy. We are looking at um, epidemiology research uh, involved in cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular fitness. Uh, there is some really interesting developing collaborations with Qatar University and Aspatar looking at the effect of um, a visual real, uh, sorry, a, a virtual reality tool to assess concussion, um, and some interesting work also where we are collaborating with our colleagues in GPM to look at the effect of um, exercise on epigenetic aging, which is um, is really interesting work going on there as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's our, our main partners at the moment we, that we are working with, Cato University, South Carolina University, as I, as I mentioned, and Aspatar. And we're also developing additional partnerships as we go along. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. Thank you all for joining the panel. Now we're going to have uh, Mr. Mohammed, a specialist representing the Office of Enrollment, who will introduce the admissions requirements. Please, uh, Mr. Mohammed, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, Salam alaikum, everyone. My name is Hamd Al Salat. I'm the admissions specialist uh, at HBKU, and I'm here to talk about the admission requirements for the College of Health and Life Sciences. Can I have the next slide, please. Okay, so for applicants that are seeking admissions into CHLS programs, uh, they will uh, require a, a strong academic record, uh, which is a minimum of three out of four in the GPA system from a recognized university. Uh, for those who are applying master, uh, for masters, we'd require them to have uh, that minimum GPA in their bachelor's program and for those who are applying for PhD in their latest uh, master's program. Uh, they will uh, require to have uh, a strong background in science and evidence of course work in their respective uh, programs that they are applying for. For those that are applying for Master in Exercise Science, uh, they would require a bachelor's in exercise science or a related field, for example, biological biomedical sciences, as well as uh, previous coursework in uh, human anatomy and physiology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, uh, all scores uh, are uh, six point five or total of seventy nine, and exemption is possible if you have studied either your master's or your bachelor's in English with the proof uh, of that, or you are a native speaker of English. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, the requirements are: you have to apply first. Uh, the application is done online. It's on our website. Uh, you'd uh, require to fill out uh, all the information. Uh, then you have to upload your academic transcript and a grading scale in, in case your GPA or sorry, your grading system is not uh, the US uh, GPA system that is out, uh, for, uh, out of four points, uh, official uh, TOEFL or R score or the exemption letter or, or proof 
of uh, English uh, as the medium of uh, instruction in your during your studies, a personal statement where you write about uh, uh, your intent, your uh, why are you applying for the program, what do you want to achieve from the uh, program, and you write about yourself a little bit. Uh, also, your identification documents, passport, and QID if you are a resident, uh, resume or a CV, an updated one. Uh, two recommendation letters for uh, the programs in uh, biomedical biological sciences and the genomics uh, and precision medicine programs. Three recommendation letters for the master in exercise science. Uh, the deadlines, as you see below, February 1st, uh, which is in a few days for international applicants, March 15th for Qatari and uh, Qatar residents uh, applicants. And uh, applications for funding, if available, will, will only be open to those who apply for admissions by March 15th. Have the next slide, please. And here are our uh, contact information. You can visit uh, the website directly uh, for the College of Health and Life Sciences, and you can send your uh, inquiries on admissions.chls at hbq.edu.qa. And I'll be happy to answer uh, any of your questions if you have. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed, for the information. All right, uh, so now for the next 40 minutes, we will be having the questions and answer uh, session. Uh, let me just uh, check the first question. Okay, so the first question is from, um, I'm sorry if I pronounced the names wrong. Um, are you mind? I think, um, how can I update an already submitted application? I omitted to my GRE scores and my applications. So they're asking how they can update it if they already submitted their applications. Uh, uh, hi, Sumaya. Uh, I, I answered some of the questions. Oh, so yes. For those, for those who have uh, forgotten to upload uh, any of the necessary documents or like extra scores or any updated scores or transcripts, uh, they can send it to the inquiries email uh, that is admissions.chls at hvku.du.qa and we'll upload them manually in their applications. All right, so do you want me to just uh, keep asking the questions that have uh, not been answered? Uh, I think, yeah, because I answered what I can during, you know, the session. Yes. Okay. For those that were not, so we can answer them right now. Um, okay. Uh, someone's asking if they can get details about scholarship program for PhD studies. Okay. Asking, um, yeah. Uh, for sorry, for scholarships uh, or like any type of funding, uh, first they need to uh, gain admission. First, they're applying for admissions. And then uh, any funding uh, opportunities will be discussed with the college itself uh, after uh, admission. Okay, and the next question is asking, um, say you have, I think he's saying, how many international PhD students are selected in the BBS program? What is the expected date to receive updates about the interview? Okay, so the number of international students, you know, differs from, uh, I guess, from year to year, because it depends on, you know, uh, the budget and the funding uh, that is uh, available for the international students. Uh, the answers will come, you know, uh, usually we do uh, uh, send the files in batches because, you know, the, the dates for application we opened the applications in november and we're ending in a few days so for those who applied earlier have already uh, their files been sent uh, to the committee and those who are applying uh, during these days are also going to have their files uh, sent to the committee uh, after the committee you know chooses and shortlists the, the students they will be contacted for any further updates yes okay um asil is asking is it necessary to have the GRE, GRE test to apply for genomics and precision medicine master's program? Uh, it was a mandatory requirement. Now it is optional. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, Sage, you have is also asking submission for research proposal is compulsory or not? Um, no, it is not uh, no. compulsory. However, it is it is encouraged if you, if they have a, a research proposal. It is encouraged to have a research proposal. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Muhammad uh, Omar Farooq is asking, what's the criteria for getting admissions in Master's Biomedical Sciences? He applied last year, but he got rejection without any specific reason mentioned. Okay, so uh, first of all, you have to meet all the minimum requirements that that have been uh, put in on you know the slide and also avail are available in the website. Uh, after meeting the requirements, then that your file is sent to the committee where they are uh, going to, you know, evaluate uh, uh, between all the applicants that meet the requirements and then they'll start to, you know, to shortlist and choose uh, those applicants uh, uh, that are going, uh, that are selected for admissions. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Rufaida. Uh, she said that she had sent her inquiry through email, but didn't get any reply. When did she send the email? Um, not mentioned. And what uh, is it about? That was the only question I get. If she's no, here, if, she, if can, you, she can bite yes. her question directly right now. Yes, please, Rafael, if you can just clarify your question. All right, another question. Um, uh, I think he's asking, he, he had a, a PhD research proposal in neurological disorder and asking to which professor he could send it to. Okay, well, when the students are admitted, they are not necessarily admitted to a specific uh, PI or supervisor, they are admitted to, uh, to the program itself, but if the, the, the student is interested to talk to a PI who is interested in neurological disorders or neurological research, he has the access to, to, to that through the website of the college. So there are you here in the college as main um, investigators, main faculty members, and there are others that are located, that they are doing research and located at the PBRI, so the student can discuss directly with them. That being said, he has to send his admission to the admission uh, office, and if he is admitted, he will be admitted to a program, not to a specific lab. Yes. Thank you. Uh, another question from Bayan. She's asking, do all students who get admitted to the PhD program receive funding? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, Sorry, if someone wants to answer from the faculty. Um, no, I was about to say, actually, um, we can have more students admitted and then they have to apply for um, the funding as uh, Mr. Muhammad earlier mentioned and uh, it has it is a competitive um, funding actually so uh, it doesn't mean that if you get admission you will get a scholarship so you need to apply and uh, be qualified and um, receive the scholarship separately yes another question from Mariam uh, she's saying, what exactly do you look for when accepting students to the Masters of Genomics and Precision Medicine? Well, um, like any other master's program, we are looking for um, good candidates, students with good academic background um, in biological, um, biomedical, medical sciences or computational sciences. And we look for um, candidates with uh, um, interest in doing research and, and kind of an inquisitiveness, inquisitive mind. If they have done some kind of research work, 
um, that will be an added advantage because um, that shows that they will have a basic knowledge about that uh, even though we will be um, teaching some courses in in the research method methodology later on but uh, doing a, some some kind of research or at least showing some interest in research uh, is very important yes um, again, two other questions from Mariam. Uh, the first one, she's asking, what are the good tips for writing a good personal statement? And then the second question is that she, she wanted to submit her online application, but there is no link for the recommendation letters. And so she sent it by email, but there is no reply. So I think that goes to the admission. Maybe I can. I can start with the uh, the personal statement probably, and then probably others can elaborate on it. Uh, well, basically, personal statement is about you as a person, and to understand for us to understand um, your background and also your aspirations. So um, it has to be concise, and uh, um, it has to cover the the important um, factors that you want to convey to us. Um, of course, um, your background in the specific field. Will be should be highlighted, and if it has to be more um, tailored towards the specific course that you're applying, rather than a generic statement. And uh, please don't send anything which you had prepared for some other university, and then even without changing the uh, name of the university. So that is kind of not taken as you're showing your interest. So maybe Dr. Fadel can. Uh, or uh, if Nathan can add in some. Yeah, no, uh, I don't have much to add. Actually, it's, yes, the, the aim of this personal statement is for us to understand what is your background and why you are interested in, spe in a specific uh, program and how well your background, how does it fit with the program? That's it. It, it, it should not be uh, 10 pages. It has to be precise, concise, and uh, and that's it. It's what is your what are your aspirations and what is your motivation to apply for a spe this specific program? That's it. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's a great point. Uh, a really important aspect of the personal statement um, is you know to state why you are applying for the program. What interests you about the program? Um, so that's something that we are looking for to show your level of interest and um, why you would like to do the program. I one of the things that I, uh, I look for a little bit in a personal statement is a little bit like um, it's a little bit like a job interview letter. You have to let us know um, your strengths and um, you know why you should be accepted into the program uh, because the standard is high so you need to um, highlight your strengths that are related to the program as well yeah but please don't oversell yourself because yeah. if, Keep it short if and, sweet. You, and then uh, it can be counterproductive during the, the interview if the, the the members of the committee feel that you have it, it is not accurate you have not been accurate has to be accurate. Thank you. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about the recommendations form. Uh, the recommendation form link uh, will show up in the submission page. You know, the confirmation of submission of the application. So once the applicant submits their application, there's a signature page where the link uh, for the recommendation form will appear. Once they fill out the the form with the the referee's uh, email. Uh, they will receive an email themselves. They will uh, fill out their form, uh, attach their uh, recommendation letter, and we'll uh, it will go to us and directly into the applicant's file. Directly, there is no need for them, you know, to send recommendation letters or anything. It will directly go and uh, be updated in their own application. Yes, okay, thank you. So uh, another question, um, Bush was asking regarding the reference letter, uh, does it have to be from professors or is it okay to be from a teaching assistant, which is not a professor or a lecturer? 
It's preferably uh, uh, to be academic, but uh, if not, it, it should be, I guess, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, from work if they are working or, you know, from a line manager or a manager if they are working. But it is recommended that it is uh, academic. Usually some of the applicants have problems if like they, uh, they graduated from, like, I guess, a long time ago and uh, they have trouble uh, uh, getting in touch with their uh, professors. Uh, they need to find someone who knows them very well and can, you know, uh, recommend them uh, as an applicant to the university. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, another question from, um... All right, then the name's not clear, but uh, he's asking, do you need all the official documents by the deadline or an official upload is sufficient for the initial review? Unofficial is fine uh, because we, we realize that some of the students or the applicants are still uh, doing their studies, so they don't have their official transcripts out yet. So if they have uh, any evidence of because usually they, uh, some of them uh, do upload uh, from the website, like the university website that uh, that shows their uh, current transcript and current standing. Uh, th that would be helpful. Uh, but uh, they can request, you know, transcripts up to the point of or, or to the semester uh, before the semester they are doing currently. So that would be possible because it will show what uh, what subjects they are. Register them in the current semester, and uh, they can tell us also. Uh, it can tell us uh, when are they expected to graduate. Thank you for the answer. Okay, so um, another answer. Uh, I'm sorry, another question. Um, he's asking: Are PhD applications for admissions? Um, in HBKU, Qatar scholarship to be applied differently. I'm not sure I can get that question correctly. Can you can you recite the question again? Can you just uh, type it again, please? Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, I whether the application has to be done separately, and there should be another application submitted for funding yes. for scholarship. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the question has been already answered. First thing is to get admitted, and only those who have been admitted officially can apply for for funding for scholarship. Uh, so may also uh, the the applicants have to know that uh, there are some like or there is some false information that is that has been spread mm -hmm. uh, regarding you know the university and the application because we have lots of inquiries uh, about hundreds we can say that the app the application is for a guaranteed scholarship with full funding and uh, they're applying uh, they're applying and they are applying for different programs they're asking uh, if they want to uh, apply for dentistry or uh, studying like different fields that are not available or different programs that are not available at HBKU because they're thinking that it's only funding this is an application for admissions to the program that are available at HBKU, and we encourage people to read uh, the, the information that is on the official uh, websites and uh, uh, social media uh, accounts of uh, HBKU. Yes, thank you for the clarification. All right, um, a question from Mr. Mohammed. Uh... Uh, he's saying, if an international PhD student is qualified for the funding, then what type of funding will he receive? I guess, uh, Malik, I think uh, you can uh, help us because, you know, it depends on the budget of the college itself. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, sure. So, Mr. Mohammed is asking if an international PhD student is qualified for funding, then what type of funding is he going to receive? For international PhD students, 
uh, we offer tuition waiver of 80 percent stipend of 7000 and housing and tickets to come and leave at the end of the program thank you you're welcome Um, I'm trying to find other questions that are not answered. So, okay, someone is asking, what is the minimum criteria to get a scholarship for PhD programs? It's the same, uh, the same question that regarding like they're asking for scholarship. First, you have to meet the minimum requirements. You are applying for admission. If you gain admission. Then uh, you will have to apply for funding if available. It, it will come to you if not, because it's on competitive basis. Thank you. Okay, um, someone, uh, Busha is asking, she's going to graduate this semester, but the admissions deadline is before uh, she graduates. So how can she submit graduation statement and the full academic transcript? uh we'd require uh, all the transcripts up to the point of you know before the last semester or for the current semester she's doing and if she meets the requirement based on that then yeah we'll wait for her to update us uh with the transcript uh once it's out uh, it's fine she can apply but she needs to give us the latest grades she has mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Mohammed Farooq is asking. So, do they uh, do he like? Um, does he have to log in using another ID, or can he use the the same ID he did from last year? And in case if it was the same one as he used before, how can he recover uh, the password or credentials? Uh, if he has the ID, uh, he can ask. Uh, he can send an email and ask. Uh, for the credentials, because maybe he inputted or the account has been locked, so the credentials should be reset. Uh, we can do that for him, but he needs to send an email to the admissions email so that uh, they can see. Or if he doesn't remember his ID, then he can make a new one and it will connect him to, uh, based on the information he put, we can connect him to his older file. Yes, okay. Um, so another similar question. Um, so he's asking, can he send uh, the recommendation letter after the admissions uh, due date is finished? Like the deadline, because he have already submitted, but uh, not without the recommendation letters. Uh, yeah, he has to get the admission, the recommendation letters as soon as possible because mm -hmm. Uh, we don't want the uh, if he meets the minimum requirements. Uh, we don't want, we don't want uh, the committee uh, reviewing his file without the recommendation letter. So it's recommended that as soon as he finishes his applications and submitted, he uh, directly sends the the link or like fill out the the, the link uh, with the recommender's email, and then they send us the recommendation letters. Yes, okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question asking how long does it take for them to get to know if they got accepted or not? Like, how long would it take for them to get a response after the submission of the application? It will take some time because we are still, the cycle is still open. Uh, the committee is still uh, reviewing some of the files. If uh, the committee has uh, any updates on uh, applicants they want to admit, uh, they will receive an update, but uh, there is no specific date on that. But uh, usually it's after, you know, the cycle ends, which is uh, for the internationals, they would receive it sooner, I guess, because the, their cycle finishes before, you know, Qataris and Qatari residents, but uh, we require first the cycle to be over. The ones that will be interviewed will be uh, in, in the BBS at least, they will be interviewed during the during February, uh, but then 
when they will receive, this is something that we don't know yet, when they will receive the official notification, that's something that we don't know yet. The GPM also, we're planning to have the first set of uh, interviews uh, tentatively, I mean, hopefully done uh, in the first week of March. So hope to um, return the uh, Brussels um, report back to the admission soon so that the admission department can then process them. Okay, thanks. Uh, someone's asking um, what type of questions are they going to ask in an interview? Well, that, that we will never tell you in advance what type of question. It will depend on your CV, it will depend on your uh, personal statements. And, uh, and the aim of these questions is to have clarifications with, with regard to what you have written and what is in your uh, resume and your CV. But for sure, we will not tell you by advance what we will be asking you, and we don't know actually. Till we meet the people and we have a chance to, to read and to uh, analyze their application, their dossier. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to read this question because I've, I've been receiving it several times. So, uh, Rafaida is asking, she wants to um, apply for biological and biomedical sciences. Her university is uh, BAC accredited and the English language was a medium of instruction. But she failed to obtain uh, the proof certificate from her college dean, and uh, due to financial causes, she cannot take IELTS. And so she's asking if she can apply for admissions, knowing that the certificate transcript stated in the study was in English language. Okay, um, which university was she in again? She didn't say the name of the university, but she's claiming that uh, it was taught in English. But she couldn't obtain the proof uh, from her college dean. Usually, what we do is that uh, we even uh, as an admissions team we check on uh, because we have like a background because I guess from experience uh, the countries that are teaching uh, scientific programs in in English. So we usually have a background on which countries are teaching in English and which of them are not. If the student does not uh, provide proof of English proficiency. What we usually do is that we go in the uh, university website and look uh, for anything that that like pr provides proof that uh, it was uh, or it, it is uh, taught in English. If yes, it, it's taught in English, we we'd exempt them uh, from like providing the letter and we send the, their file to the committee. If we do have our doubts, we would wait on the applicant we would send them an email to provide proof of english or provide an, uh, an english test score thank you um i guess other questions are really repeated questions um if anyone wants to ask another question rather than all of the questions that have been answered already please do Uh, some, um, Mr. Uh, Adris Mohammed is asking how many international seats for genomics and precision medicines. It's not fixed actually. So whether it is international, it depends on the the um, candidates, number of candidates applying. Good candidates apply, then we we might give admission. Of course. The funding scholarship is completely different, so you might get admission, but then you need to be competitive enough to get the, the funding. Thank you. Um, a question that I got it twice. Someone's asking when will the interview be for residents? Well, actually, the we're not looking at it as residents or International basically all those who have applied um, by the deadline, the first deadline, which is uh, 1st of February, um, we will be interviewing all those um, candidates together, whether they are international or residents of Qatar. And then there is like um, the residents can, if they haven't applied uh, until that date, they can still apply. Um, I think um, Mr. Mohammed, it is 15th of March. Oh, yes. 
yeah so yeah so so that will be there will be will be conducting another interview for those candidates who yes. applied uh, after the first deadline yeah so it will be, be between 15 march 15 and early april i would say yes Okay, I guess uh, these are all the questions, and uh, I've I've getting I've been getting repeated questions actually to to what has already been answered. So, any new questions? Okay, uh, I've already answered this question, but she's keep uh, asking me again. So, is GRE still required? GRE is optional. Okay, there you go. So for the um, the exercise science course, isn't she's it? asking for whom? Optional for whom? No, it's also optional for exercise science as well. All the programs at VHLS, GRE is optional. If you have it, then you can upload it. If you want to do it and upload it, that is fine. If uh, you don't want to upload it, also it's fine. It's not a mand mandatory requirement. I think it's what Rani that's asking. Yeah. GRE is optional for all the programs at College of Health and Life Sciences. Okay. Um, Idris Mohammed is asking Can a graduate of BTEC Food Science and Technology be admitted to study GPM program? Science and technology probably is uh, a bit away from the genomics and precision medicine. Um, so the background, we'll look at the background of the student and uh, we'll see if, if there is any relevant kind of courses they have taken. Otherwise, um, uh, food science and technology is, um, I, I can't see much of connection actually with uh, the genomics and precision medicine course. Okay, um, no more questions. Uh, any, any more questions? Muhammad Al-Washhabi, he is asking why do, no, do not you reply to which question, Muhammad? Oh yeah, I think uh, we already replied that. It was, um, what, I need to go scroll up. Okay, also for the, like, the main question that he asked that we did not answer. I can't find it. So. Yeah, I think Mr. Muhammad the Salat, he answered him already. I saw it uh, right away. Yes, uh, he was asking as a graduate of Dr. Pharmacy program, can he still like apply in biomedical? And he said yes. Yes. Okay, someone is asking the same, uh, the same person, Mr. Muhammad uh, Farooq. Can you tell him the scholarship details that would be provided to get to get a successful inter uh, international students of uh, masters of biomedical and biological sciences? Malik earlier probably um, answered that question. I think Malika answered the question for uh, for PhD. PhD. He's asking now for okay. masters. masters. I think the difference is in stipend, if I'm not mistaken. Malika, can you elaborate? Yes, that's correct. So they also get eighty percent tuition waiver, a stipend of five thousand if they're not working, and if. Uh, they are international, they get housing and tickets to come here and to leave after the program. Um, another person is asking, when is the results for admitted students will be announced?
Uh, we're still uh, receiving applications. Uh, the committee are still receiving uh, those who met the minimum requirements. Once we have an update after the committee does uh, the interviews and uh, their evaluation, we will contact the students and uh, update them. Okay, um, I think I'm going to take this last question. Um, it has been repeated already, but let's take it. So, someone's asking, how can they prove that their university was in English instead of taking the other steps? But because it's the last question, so I'll take it. Should I should I answer that? Which because I see two questions actually. Um. But they were all repeated because on the same one, it's also repeated again, but because it's the last question, I think we're getting at the end of the session. And uh, so I took that last question asking if, how can they prove that the university was in English instead of taking the IELTS test? Like, how can they yeah. prove that? They can request a letter from the university. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, it's also worth noting that some of the universities uh, do mention uh the language of instruction on the transcript itself so if that is there then there's no need for a uh, uh, letter of proof but it's, it's not mentioned and we cannot specify if uh they teach in english especially for some universities uh, some universities let's say also in the gcc teach in, uh, in Arabic and English the same program. So if that cannot be proven in any way that we'd, we'd require the letter or they'd have to uh, do the one of the English tests, whether it's IELTS or TOEFL. Okay, um, thank you so much for answering all these questions. However, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this evening. I apologize if we were not able to address the rest of your questions. Um, I'd like to thank you all and for the panelists uh, for their time and infor informative answers. And thank you to the audience and members for their attendance and wonderful participation. Uh, for those who still have questions, I'd like to encourage you to please email their uh, um, respective faculty members with your questions. They will be more than happy to help you with anything you would like to know. And uh, good luck for the applicants, and we look forward to welcoming you to HBKU, inshallah. <laughs>